Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the latest Shiny Podcast. This is your host, Stephen Spector. And with me, as, as usual, is Rob Hirschfeld. Good afternoon, Rob. Good afternoon, Stephen. I'm humming an uh, intro song in my mind. I'm, I'm all set on the... <laughs> so we, are, we do apologize. We are supposed to have an intro song by now, but I have lacked in my duties as a podcaster to get that. But we are working towards an intro song. And if you hear this and you have a perfect idea, let us know. We're always happy for community imp- input. But, yeah, the, uh, the, the, ba- the backstory is that Stephen doesn't like my suggestion for the intro, which <laughs> is, is the wind up, which is the wind up gun from Half Life. Mm-hmm. You know, I ride. had some sort of I don't know African music or something that was going like like it was. Uh, you know, I don't know what it was going. I had I guess she didn't like. So anyway, let's bring our poor guest on who's sitting here going, "Why am I here?" So uh, with us today is Mike Kyle, who uh, is a technology leader and and, uh, he's not currently at a company right now. He must be just kind of floating in the Pacific, enjoying life on a sailboat. That's my, imagine what you're doing, Mike. I wish that were the case. I think as far as a intro song or or ballad, uh, thankfully it's not the background music from the video game Fortnite, which I hear far too often from our boys playing on a daily basis. (laughs) Well, that game has really just take. I know my son plays it constantly and his friends. And it's weird because one day it just appeared and now every other game no longer exists. It's always amazing how that happens. When you tune, when you tune the, the variables just right to, to reel people in. Well, they've done a, a good job. So, Mike, why don't you go ahead and give us a, a short background, if you can, and then we'll uh, jump in from there. Sure. And thanks for having me. So... My background is 25 plus years in technology, uh, dating way back when to a computer science degree from Iowa State University. And then I was a classic kind of Unix system network administrator for several years, or as I like to put it now, I was embracing the culture of DevOps before that was a, a cool buzzword, as well as dabbling in things like big data and security. And then, you know, kind of fast forwarding through a bunch of early stage companies and large companies, I ended up running IT operations at Netflix, uh, then becoming CIO at Yahoo, uh, and then working for a, for a few years at a Boston-based cybersecurity uh, startup called Cybrick. And now I'm making a decision as to what I'm doing next. That's and I've also, been, I've also been and currently advising startups of various uh, sectors including the, uh, the buzzword of the day called blockchain. Oh, and we'll have some fun. I wanna, I wanna dive in a little bit on blockchain and the realities of blockchain. You and I met at the uh, blockchain conference, also known as IBM Think. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but, but first, I was good to reprieve our Rantcast format every once in a while especially since I, I know I can count on you to, to give it start, start with the good rant for listeners every once in a while. And if, if you want to do it more, just you got to find the right, the right guests. We do a rant cast format, which is we start with something that, you know, our guest finds troubling, like the definition of private cloud. If you go back to Eric Wright's podcast, and <laughs> we sort of let loose on that topic and then pause and then actually explain why people are, using it or explaining it. Uh, we could do a whole one on blockchain, actually, Bitcoin <laughs> and cryptocurrencies, but that's not the topic. Uh, Mike, Mike has a rant to, to start off with on government, GDPR, sort of government trying to get its fingers in the middle of security and legislate security and operations. Mike, do you, does that tee it up? Do you, what's, what's your rant? Yeah, no, I think that works. Like, you know, given the uh, decline in Bitcoin price today, it's probably not good to throw salt in the wound of cryptocurrency and blockchain just yet. Older, older, older. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no, I think, you know, the current state, past, present, and probably future state of cybersecurity is pretty abysmal from my perspective. And there was an article I believe came out yesterday or last night about you know, the forthcoming potential for regulation in cybersecurity here in the US, much like the general data protection uh, regulations that went to effect in the EU back in late May. And and my perspective is, you know, trying to add more levels of bureaucracy and regulations to something that's already fundamentally broken is not the proper way to solve for it. I think 
one soundbite I heard over the past three years that was troubling and also very revealing from CIOs and CISOs is that security is important, but not a priority. And it has to be a, a priority. It doesn't have to be the, the single priority, but it has to be thought about in anywhere from doing cloud architecture to proper application design and development and integrated in uh, from the onset, instead of trying to bolt on with uh, you know, fancy new security products and offering and, and next gen solutions. Definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again. And I feel like that's what we've been doing in the security sector, is everybody you know, buys the same variant of a product and applies it, but doesn't really maintain it or, or give it the proper care and feeding. Breaches occur, but then as we've seen from some of the mega breaches, there's no long-term ramifications. The share price may drop if it's a publicly traded company uh, for a few weeks, but then it goes right back up or beyond where it was before. So at the end of the day, it feels like no one really takes it seriously. Meanwhile, probably all of our personally identifiable data, such as our social security number, birth date, mother's maiden name, bank account numbers, is all floating out there on the, the internet or at least the dark web. You're saying we're compromised. The cost to a company for furthering that situation seems zero. Yeah, and I mean, it makes sense for governments to, to get angry about that, right? It's the people it's supposed to be representing the people. Do you think government has responsibility? I, I think there's a key word that you just mentioned there, and that's people. It's always the, the classic people process technology. The technology to implement proper security exists, and there's proper processes for doing it, but the cultural inertia that exists, whether it's in the government sector or in the, the public private sector, is, is part of, is probably the root cause of the problem. Like I said before, no one or very few people actually take security seriously or, or view it as their responsibility. And ultimately, as an organization, you're only as secure as your, as your least sophisticated or secure user. So you have to, to start building that security awareness from a cultural standpoint and making it ingrained or embedded into daily thinking. And once again, it doesn't have to be the top priority, but it has to be part of your overall DNA. But wait a minute, I, I'm gonna push back on you because right, I'm building product. When that product, you know, if that out-of-the-box experience, if that first user experience with a product isn't, isn't awesome and easy, which usually security is neither of those two words, then they're not going to use it, right? I, nobody starts up you know, our product or anyone I've seen and says, that was awesome security experience. I'm really excited. You know, now I get to try the product. Where do we fix that? So I, I completely agree with you that for the most part, the security user experience is broken, uh, is a barrier to entry. And that doesn't have to be the case. I think engineers in general are become overly enamored with the how of technology instead of the why of it and why of user experience. And there has to be some design thinking brought into the security productization of anything. And that we have to do, you know, proper UI UX testing, and include security in that, so that the onboarding or whatever the experience is for the product or platform isn't uh, isn't frustrating and cause people to go away. And I think there's there's plenty of onboarding experiences. Like I just onboarded a new Sony PlayStation 4 for our kids uh, a month or so ago. It took forever, and there was no security as part of that. So I think there's a, there's a lot of work to be done in design thinking in UX and security uh, is a good time right now to start integrating that in. Do you think that the social media over, you know, the face, I'll just give it, you know, use Facebook sort of as a placeholder for a much broader problem of making data over, overly accessible, you know, where my, my sharing settings are hard to do or they're confusing or as we find out, they, they aren't actually applied correctly and a whole bunch of things are shared. Is this, is that also a component of security? Because you mentioned GDPR in the, the rant. No, I think th that topic in the Facebook or any social or any product security settings is analogous to what we said or I said earlier about regulations. 
layering on more and more controls that are confusing and somewhat conflicting, if not designed properly, it just frustrates people. So they either take the approach I do and they're just like, okay, I'm just turning all of it off. I'll live my life fully public and, and not worry about them screwing it up or me screwing it up. Or you're constantly having, having to tweak those privacy settings. Uh, and it turns out that oftentimes it doesn't really matter because the vendor or, or platform provider has a bug on their back end that kind of negate any privacy setting. So I think trying to make them uh, more complex, <laughs> a lot of regulations, I'm is feeling, not the I'm route. Feeling, I'm feeling sick. So we've got too much <laughs> complexity to actually turn it on. And then you turn it on and it didn't work. And then I, I was going to ask you, you teed up a question to me, which is, is there a profit motive in keeping it confusing? Right? Is you know, just like having these uh, acceptable use uh, contracts that are so onerous to read that you just accept them. You know, that's a business tactic, in my opinion. It's, it's not the lawyers who are making, necessarily making acceptable use contracts this onerous. It's people who don't want you to, to actually understand what they're asking. Now, you know, I, I'm putting on my tinfoil hat at this point, but you know, is, is, the, is profit motive part of the problem in the security, right? You know, just like I, you know, I, I threw out profit motive in front of you saying, hey, if I make things secure, they're harder to adopt, nobody wants to come. Where, where's the balance? So first, it sounds like you've been a victim of the denial of, of terms of service or privacy policy updates that hit back when GDPR went into effect. You know, how many of those emails did you actually read all the way through? Archive. Yeah. The first one, I, I think I might, I might have read, since Stephen's on the phone. You might have read uh, ours. I might have read ours. <laughs> <laughs> and, that's and, and that's one more than I did. That's just a template. <laughs> And then to address your profit motive, I think, you know, the, the soundbite from, from a few years ago is data is the new oil uh, and oil means profit. So companies, everybody needs to understand that companies use your data to incur profit, whether that's targeted marketing, personalized marketing, or, or selling your data to other people so they can, they can target you. And there, there's some consumer value to that as well, but I think there's, common ground and really comes back from my perspective to transparency. Like just tell me how you're using my data instead of trying to cover it up or, or be cute about it or nefarious, depending on your perspective. You know, if you, if you explain things in simple terms or what, what we often call like the, the grandparent rule, like how do I explain this technology to my grandparents who did not grow up in it? And I think companies, whether they're using data for profit or not, need to start doing that instead of once again, making it more and more complex or delivering security through obscurity. So I think it needs to be security through transparency. That leads me sort of into an interesting approach to solving this. Typically when, when you like download an app or something like that, the settings on it, you, you're giving away all of it. They open up everything. Is it reasonable to do security that is actually on demand and more incremental? from that perspective, would that solve this problem better? Where basically I come in, my, you know, my camera app asks me for my location information because it wants to geotag all my photos, but I don't care for the most part if my photos are geotagged or not. Does it make sense to be more demand-based for security, minimal permissions and then, then incrementally add, or is that just a nuisance? No, I go back to my days of configuring you know, perimeter hardware-based firewalls. The common stance is let's default deny. So deny everything unless it's you know, expressly allowed. Give the control to the consumer and say, I'm willing to share this part of my data or I'll accept geotagging or you know, whatever the service is, but I will deny access to anything else. I believe for the most part, it's the current state we live in is the exact opposite of that. It's default allow everything. Back to my tinfoil hat. The companies want the data, so if you're not sharing it, then they can't, you know, they don't have the access. In some cases, I think it's just, if my camera doesn't geotag by default, then I'm going to be sad because I took a whole bunch of pictures that weren't geotagged. Maybe we all need to be grown-ups and accept responsibility for it, or the app should nag me and say, geotagging is off. Would you like it, you know, would you like to turn it on? Yes, no, never. Later, yes, later, never. 
That, does that work? Is that a, an improvement? Perhaps take it one step further. Say, okay, okay allow, allow this feature. And here in plain English terms is what that means. Because mm -hmm. otherwise most people, whether you're in technology or not, you'll select it and kind of gloss through it or gloss over it instead of taking the time to fully understand what that means. Once again, going back to transparency, I think there's a pretty severe lack of transparency in security and privacy today. Let me flip it because in a lot of cases, you have data is flowing through these applications and you, you're passing data through. Let's say you, you want, is this, is this camera analogy useful? Because we could switch to something more descriptive. That's, that one is just simple. Well, I think in today's photo first um, technology uh, society, I think the camera is a, a perfect use because okay. the amount of, of privacy and data loss, whether it's location or just your personal location of what you do and hobbies is, is important. So I, I turn on my, my, my camera app. I geotag my photos or it does it for me because I clicked a acceptable use policy and it turned on all sorts of things. I didn't have a choice to make a fine green thing. I, Pick, I had to pick everything. Then by default, the camera is also, as a, fee, as a convenience for me, uploading all of my photos to my, the camera manufacturer's cloud backup, Google's cloud backup, uh, Slack, it has access to them, so it's probably finding them. And so does half a dozen apps on my phone have access, Facebook and Twitter and everybody else, right? So now everybody can conceivably be scanning that data. Is that a fair assessment of status quo? Yeah, I think that's probably even uh, even mild on the surface. I think the data probably exists places outside of that, but I think on the on the surface that that covers it. How do you explain? Do you, or like, or maybe you personally, do you care about that? Like, do you care where your photos go, where they're stored, how they're how they're handled, or or who has access to them? Let's assume that I'm okay with the people getting the data that, that they have access to it. There's, there's actually a lot more information in that feature that I just enabled than I realize is sort of, sort of, this is where I'm going. So I, I want to flip, I want to flip the question around and look at it from a, just how much data is going and what companies actually can use, right? Let's say I gave them permission to do it. They have the data. I'm okay with that. My understanding is there's a lot more data in the, the, the casual information I'm sharing with those providers than I realize. Yeah, I think the, the chance or likelihood of data privacy leakage is quite high. What I fear, and I'm not a privacy uh, zealot by any means, but if I, if I enable access and then disable it, is it truly disabled? Or you know, is there some eventual consistency mm -hmm. to that disabling? Does it take a couple days? There's no once again, transparency into that process and what, well, you know, how long does disabling take? Uh, well, or is it, is it going to go retroactive? Uh, GDPR did a good job from that perspective of you being able to hit a delete button because what I'm thinking is, right, I have, I'm trying not to pick on any one vendor, but I'll, I'll pick on, you know, I have a Samsung phone and I send gam my camera. I'm sure that there's Samsung camera interactions back to Samsung and I don't do much social media interaction with Samsung except use the phone and the default apps. And yet, my expectation is that they are able to process and analyze data coming off of my phone based on things I signed and, and acceptable use policies and permissions I gave the default apps. I'm just assuming that, that that's a yes. How much of that data do you think it's right for them to manage, look at, process, Right. Do I, should I be giving, I gave them permission to do it, but what if they're going, they're actually analyzing my photos or they're tracking my phone, they're looking at my behaviors. They're doing that. Is that okay? I gave them permission. Uh, I think there's, there's the gray area of, you gave them permission to access it. You did not give them permission to analyze it. Mm, and, and, they, okay. and then use that analysis for profit motives or other motives. And I think that's where if we do have any regulations that they have to be more easier to understand, but more fine grained, which hopefully is not mutually exclusive. But if I grant you access to something, that doesn't mean you can use it in a myriad of ways. That to me is where we're, we're not at all 
aware, except I think very select people in these companies, I, I think even mi the majority of people in the companies aren't aware of how deeply this data could be used. And I'm back to my tinfoil hat with the likelihood that there's pretty deep analysis going on for the data. But if you have it, I can't imagine them not using it. One startup I'm advising, uh, not to go off on a tangent, but I think it's, it's covering encryption and how do I encrypt and keep my data. Mm. They have a patent around zero knowledge encryption. And how to think about that is you, you have the, your private encryption keys to your data, you being the individual. And it's much like going to a hotel and you get a, a, a hotel, a key to your room. Only you have a key to the room. The hotel does not have the key to your room. So they cannot go access it and analyze the contents of your room unless you allow them to. That's what needs to happen for true data privacy to ever um, be realistic. So now I control how I encrypt my personal data. And if I want to give a third party access to it, I now have a finer level of granularity of what they can access for how long and ideally an audit log trail of what they did with that. You just described blockchain to me. Is that was that my, uh, that was my Trojan horse to get you onto that. Uh, that I was about topic. to go to, I was about to go to blockchain anyway, but this is the promise of distributed ledger. I wanted to take this conversation into that because I think we just teed up really well why distributed ledger and private control of data is important and then knowing who has access to your data. However, blockchain is, is variant enough that I wanted you to define blockchain or distributed ledger. Give, give us your take on it before we dive into the broader ramifications. And a simplistic definition to not get all um, technical here. Distributed ledger or blockchain is a way to store transactions in a distributed manner that are verified by some, some computational algorithm uh, and that also provides immutability and a full audit log. So no one can go in and modify the record that was recorded into the ledger. To correct a common, either verify or correct a common misconception, is it computationally practical to sustain a blockchain? The famous Bitcoin example is that Bitcoin, every transaction is getting so expensive to verify that it's not a sustainable thing. Is that a generally true statement or a specifically true statement for, for Bitcoin? I believe it's generally true for distributed ledger or blockchain today, except for probably a handful of solutions, if not less. I think the, the, the scalability challenges around distributed ledger are now being discovered outside of Bitcoin and the, the computational algorithm and the latency involved. Uh, I think there's a few companies that have solved this. Uh, I've seen at least one, but it's not widely published. And I think we'll start seeing the, the pain of blockchain uh, scaling as companies try to adopt it. It's fraught with a certain degree of danger, right? We see, we see examples in industry of early adopters where they are running into these technical challenges. What's the promise? Why, why keep at it? I mean, much like the early days of even relational databases, they had scaling problems or single point of failure problems. Some only solved that or you know, have gotten better at it. And I think the same thing will be true for blockchain. My worry right now is because of the over exuberance around cryptocurrencies and how blockchain gets conflated with that, that blockchain is viewed as magic and you can go in and replace your Oracle database, for example, with a distributed ledger. Everything will work better and faster and stronger and more secure. And I've actually, <laughs> unfortunately, I've heard that at a conference that somebody was considering that and will not move the blockchain technology world forward, uh, nor will it move anything. Forward. It might move a check from a naive venture capitalist forward. And NoSQL didn't, didn't solve that problem either as a miracle cure. What's the good application? Sort of a bright light on the distributed ledger horizon? So I think any place where there is a, a broker or middleman that you can disintermediate is a good place to start looking to leverage blockchain and scale out. I think there's a lot of places in the world that are inefficient. The financial markets or banking sector, probably more, most specifically. 
And there's a bunch of lesser scale use cases that we can start with and solve as we figure out how to solve kind of the scalability challenges around distributed ledger technology in general. One other place is this whole notion of digital identity. I hope we can all agree that the social security number identification system is severely broken or literally every hacker in the world has your social security number so it's absolutely worthless to you. And that we need a true digital identity that's immutable and can be used outside of a, a paper card or inputting your, your SSM. I want to drill on identity for a second and then I want to come back to uh, blockchain. But I'm a strong believer that identity is much more important than people realize. How does fixing identity then translate into other fields? Where, where's, identity, where's a lack of identity being a bottleneck for us in security? My view of identity is it's composed of, of two, two facets. Authentication, which most everyone's familiar with, that's who you are. There's some like username, password, or, or more multi-factor authentication. The lesser known component is authorization, meaning uh, can you access what you're trying to access? And that needs to be a first-class citizen in any digital identity solution in order for us to move the security needle forward. I know we always pair Auth-Z, Auth-Z and AuthN, authentication and authorization. Isn't all of it sort of hinged on, do I, know, do I know who this individual is, that we actually have an identity? Because it sounded like you were saying, look, I need to be able to know that I'm granting access to the right person or system, right? Machine identity is actually equally important from a permissions perspective. And do we have a, a workable do you see workable solutions on the horizon that, that people can adopt? I think we're getting better at making two-factor or multi-factor authentication, which solves the problem first of are you who you say you are. And I think we're making that more usable for everyone outside of you know, tech hubs like Silicon Valley that understand it and, and kind of can deal with the, the pain threshold of, of that. And hopefully, you know, as, as biometrics and other methods of authentication get get more viable that makes it more seamless and then we can also address the authorization component afterwards so i I still think there's a lot of work to be done in authentication hoping there's a there's a handful of smart smart executives and startups doing that it feels to me like we're getting better at doing cryptographic authorization right we're we understand passwords are compromised sort of by default and we're starting to do a better job of saying, I'm going to give you a certificate or a token, especially a short lived token, and then, and then manage those processes. That feels better. I don't think everybody's working using their UB key to unlock their computer. When I start looking at who is accessing, I wanted to jump back to the distributed ledger because I think one of the things that's overlooked in distributed ledger is being able to control who has, re- has read access of a ledger is also um, a component of, of some of these models. Is that, is that, that's my understanding, is that right? That's my understanding as well. And I think that's, that's a really important feature is that you know, I control, let's say the read and write uh, permissions because of the, um, the immutability and audit log associated, I can see exactly when that happened you know, by who, from where, and when. Once again, going back to the, the rant of transparency or lack thereof, that provides transparency. I have this vision in my mind of, of me switching to a, a distributed ledger for photo app, right, on my phone, and then all of a sudden getting pings back. The bank wants access to my photo reserves. The car lender wants access to my photo reserves, right? Actually seeing people who are asking to participate in the ledger. Is that, a, is that how this would work? Yeah, the, there is the, the fear of solicitors, much like the, the people that come to your physical residence asking for access or something. You're going to have yeah. distributed ledger solicitors, I would imagine. <laughs> I've never heard that, with that before. All right, so somebody literally saying, hey, I want to participate in this blockchain, and then they can see all, the, all of your data from that perspective, or whatever data is in the, in the chain. And then how do you verify that solicitor is really your bank? Which is why we need a true digital identity system that works in concert with distributed ledger. 
I'm thinking that made me think of SSL verification, right? Where, where we're verifying that the domain name associated with the SSL certificate is legitimate, is a real business, and not you know Google with an extra O in, in the certificate. Which we still haven't gotten correct. Now I'm back to the rant cast. I'm feeling very sad at the moment. These are hard, these are really hard problems. Are, are they, are they, just process problems? Is it just we don't have the tech? Is there just too many scammers? I mean, where, where, do, we, where do we claw, stop going deeper in the abyss? There's a few companies now doing this or taking this approach, which is called zero trust security. So assume you have no security, and what do you do to increase it or enhance it? Instead of assuming you're secure by default and then trying to layer things on. So how do you do proper architecture and this, once again, user experience and design, assuming that at the base there is n nothing is secure. And I think at first blush, that probably sounds somewhat depressing or defeatist, but I think it actually frames the people part of the people process technology equation properly to start thinking about all the ways to start layering in usable security protections and alerts instead of trying to bolt them on after something is designed assuming that it, it was secure because there's always going to be loopholes or workarounds but how do you look for anomalous behavior in near real time and, and we can start thinking about other buzzwords such as machine learning which will power artificial intelligence to help combat that that addresses where we started, which is if I want to be more secure by default, I'm going to turn things off, zero trust, and then I'm going to add, add in the things I want. Is that a fair way to su sort of summarize what's happening? Yeah, and then, and then you need to be, right, currently you have to be very diligent on your own behalf about making sure that all the settings are correct. And then we also have to put some implicit or explicit trust in the providers we use. Unfortunately, most of them have proven not to be that secure or at least forthright with how they're using our data. If they were, if they were, <laughs> governments would be even more involved, which is I think where GDPR came, came from, right? Right, uh, so, I don't, so I think maybe that is where regulations come in and there should be some ramifications. I mean, I'll use the, the poster child of Equifax as a bad example, mm -hmm. but that was a, a colossal screw up. The fact that there was no, there's no real ramification there is disturbing. When I look at the Equifax thing, there's a regulatory problem in the middle of all this stuff that to me was, is financially motivated in that your credit score is default open, not default closed. That one thing, which I think is what we're describing here. If I should be, I should have to, and it's a pain, but I should have to go and say, yes, this person has access to my credit every time somebody wants access. No, absolutely. Because uh, ironically, access to your credit score affects your credit score. So if you don't control it, you have less control over your overall credit score, which seems unfair. Yeah. And this to me is a, is a great regulatory example where this is, this is fundamental personal data. It has to do with financial regulations for multiple parties. Keep it fair and secure. Actually, let me ask this as a question. Is that a, a good regulatory topic? Can the government get involved there? My view is it is a good regulatory topic if you have the proper technologists who also understand business involved. But can't we just abstract it without the tech and just say, we want people's credit history to be in their control, not in a court, not, not, not control externally. I mean, does that, can we get to a point where there's a, this very simple filter that says, if it's personal data, the fault controls come back to the person? Or is it, because that's not where we are, not by a long shot. <laughs> no, I, absolutely. Yeah, and I didn't, I didn't expound upon, I said technologists that also understand the business. So what I meant by that was not being, like I said earlier, enamored with the technology how, but the overall why and being able to explain that in overall layman's terms, and then applying the technology where appropriate. And I think in today, I think we're probably over indexed on the political business side without the tech. And we don't want to overcorrect and bring in just pure technologists that will make it all complex. And 
they understand all of these settings and how to tweak them. And, you know, then our parents call us and like, I have no idea what I'm doing with this, this application or, or device. Something, something I think in, in a couple of years, we're going to be calling Zuck it up <laughs> as a, <laughs> Ah, uh, that was horrible. But yeah, the, so I mean, this in in a way, we're full circle. The, the the rant cast, you know, come back to saying we need to have individuals be able to control, you know, their data. And and if we don't, as technology platforms and vent and, and vendors make it possible to control, then the government's going to step in. Is that sort of the the gist? I'll nuance my answer to that a little bit. I think security has always been control-based, and I think it also needs to include context and understandable context about what, why this control, this control was implemented. So if you go back before where you're talking about the photo app and geotagging, giving context around what that is and what it means for your photo data is important. And I think we need, as, as a technology society in the country, you need to start doing that. And that has to be designed in from the onset. I think you're right. And then I, I, I think we also covered that if they give you a context, you're doing this so that your photos, you can track the location where you took the photo and tag it. They, there can't be a secondary or tertiary context that they aren't revealing because they want to, because they're, they're giving you different utility. Right. If I took this picture at a hotel in Hawaii, I don't want the photo storage provider to be able to present that to that hotel to then try to upsell me on something else. Or use that photo in one of their advertisements for the resort without your permission. Right. We've covered a lot of ground I didn't expect to cover. I love Rankcast from that perspective. Is there, is there some point, Mike, that, that we should, we're, we're missing in, in wrap up? Uh, no, I mean, I personally am now thoroughly depressed about the state of security or, or lack thereof. So, uh, uh, no, I think you know, I think we've covered we've covered it all. And I think I, I'll just end with I, I really believe that security needs to be at the base of the technology stack, and always thought about versus kind of this group or technology that gets added on later. That means I should stop writing down my passwords on pieces of paper. Is that the uh, general gist of this whole thing? Only if they're distributed pieces of paper. With the <laughs> old school distributed ledger. It's a shredder. <laughs> shredder. Very funny. Hey, Mike, thanks for joining us. If anyone is interested in getting a hold of you, finding you on social media, or where's the best places to look for you? I'd say Twitter is the best place. Uh, Twitter handle is at at uh, M D K A I L. Thanks again for uh, joining us today. And this was uh, quite a different spin. The idea of being able to authenticate yourself to a blockchain was something, Rob, I don't think we had talked about. And uh, I like it. So if this block, so you could have the securest blockchain in the world, but if anyone can access it, then it's not really secure. It just continues to get worse. I think is the solution. Is the, maybe this is why people might just throw their hands up and say, forget it. It's too hard. <laughs> Steven's still a skeptic. Always a skeptic. Well, thanks again for joining us, both of you. I look forward to talking it again, Mike. And, you know, when you do finally decide we're going to world live and stop living on that sailboat sailing around the uh, <laughs> Pacific, do let us know. And perhaps we'll talk again. Thanks again.